Finally, Glenn Coulthard. It's a member of the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation and a professor in First Nations and Indigenous Studies programs and in the Department of P Political Science at the University of British Columbia. Glenn writes in the areas of Indigenous thought and politics, contemporary political theory, and radical social and political thought. Glenn is the author of Red Skin, White Masks, Rejecting the Colonial Politics of Recognition, and the co-editor of Recognition versus Self-Determination, the limits of emancipatory politics. Welcome, Glenn. The place in which we're gathered today is rich in the theory and practice of indigenous political alliance, as, as Darren's introduction and welcome um, acknowledged. Holding the histories and presence of not only the Haudenosaunee, but also the Mississauga Anishinaabeg and the Wendant nations. These nations negotiated and continue to practice diplomatic relationships with each other and to share the land while respecting each other's governance, jurisdiction, and sovereignty. Each nation also exists in a deep reciprocal relationship with the Great Lakes, in particular Lake Ontario, and the waterways that flow into it. These nations foster deep relations to the St. Lawrence River leading to the Atlantic Ocean, the diverse plant and animal nations within their territories, the thunderer and the rains, and all the physical and spiritual forces that connect them to this place, their place of creation in an intimate and meaningful way. Now this theory and practice of indigenous alliance and solidarity is informed what I have called elsewhere grounded normativity, by which I mean the, the modes of indigenous land-based practices and long-standing experiential knowledge and expertise that inform and structure our ethical and political relationships with the world around us. Grounded normativity thus houses and reproduces the, these practices and procedures based on a relational ontology of deep reciprocity that are inherently informed by an intimate relationship of ourselves with place. Grounded normativity teaches us how to live our lives in relationship to other people and other than human life forms in a profoundly non-authoritarian, non-exploitative, and non-dominating way. Grounded normativity teaches us how to be in a respectful political relationship with other indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples with whom we might share territorial responsibilities or common political and economic interests. Our relationship to the land itself generates these processes, practices, and knowledge that inform our political systems and through which we understand and enact solidarity. I would therefore like to accept today's conference invitation to speak to the way that we might aim to, quote, open up new ways of seeing, studying global movement assemblages, the connections among them, the agencies they unleash, and the different possible worlds they call into being. And specifically to do so in conversation with critical humanist traditions, uh, notably feminism, anti-racism, post-colonialism, and indigenous social and political thought. My contribution then will focus on the global dimension of indigenous people's place and form struggles, particularly as they were and continue to be articulated with both the black radical and anti-colonial traditions epitomized by the revolutionary work of Frantz Fanon. Someone who I have gained much insight and inspiration from in my own work, but also because his influence here in the story that I'm telling or uh, will tell is just simply a fascinating one, I think. When I first began to conduct research on my own community's struggle for self-determination over a decade ago, it became immediately clear to me that our leaders in the Dene Nation saw our decolonized efforts as necessarily linked to the struggles of colonized peoples elsewhere, both domestic and international. Indeed, the Dene Nation was explicit about these connections. Consider, for example, the following statement written into the first draft of the Dene Declaration of 1975 which is 16 pages as opposed to the two that is, uh, that's published publicly. It states unequivocally that our quote, many lessons for the Dene to learn from the development of third world countries. In colonies of the imperial powers, they everywhere failed to develop. Their prospects necessarily improved to the extent that they were successful in gaining independence. But even after formal political independence, many have had trouble developing because of the power of the so-called multinational corporations which they're based in a small number of highly developed industrial societies has denied their genuine economic independence. Only with tremendous effort from the people can an economy independent from outside control be built. Um, from outside control be built. Our situation in the north is the same of those in the uh, people struggling in the third world. 
The draft of the declaration ends with two appendices, one outlining a declaration on development, proposing an alternative mixed economy, privileging a contemporary Bush mode of production on the one hand, and in cases where the nation forays into industrial activity, worker-owned and operated enterprises, and a ban on pro property on the other. In other documents, this is proposed economy is posited as more in sync with a Dene collective orientation of our values. The second appendix is about strategy and includes recognition that we face enemies both from within and without. The former as a result of the internalized colonialism that has called, or, um, caused us to turn against our own. Now I just recently came across this draft of the declaration in the archives and when I looked at it, it kind of made sense to me. Um, this idea of formal independence occurring simultaneously with economic subjugation, enemies from within and without spawn and reproduced through an internalization of one's own subjecthood. All of these concepts were drawn from the third world theorizing of the likes of Albert Memmi, Nkwame, Nkwame Nkrumah, and of course, Frantz Fanon. In turning to these theorists, we were not, as critics of the day suggested, however, uh, simply being brainwashed, brainwashed by our white consultants. Rather, we were critically engaging in a global assemblage of anti-imperialist actors that had well-established roots among radicals of all stripes in Canada during the 1960s and 70s. Fanon, in particular, was a central figure in these conversations. Now, Fanon's impact in North America, especially in the United States, has been well noted by scholars like Baba and Stuart Hall. In particular, Fanon's writings on colonial racism and national liberation um, indelibly shape the more militant arm of the civil rights movement, as well as both the black and red power movements of the 1960s. One can read both explicit and implicit traces of Fanon's thought, for example, in the writings of Dennis Banks, of the American Indian Movement, of the great black militant Malcolm X, Huey Newton, and Bobby Seale of the Black, Party, or black Panther Party for Self-Defense, and in the writings of ex-Panther Eldridge, Eldridge Cleaver, who was once famously quoted as saying that at the heyday of the black power movement, quote, every brother on the rooftop could quote Fanon. Now the profound mark that Fanon left on 1960s and 70s anti-imperialist and anti-colonial radicalism led Stuart Hall to declare the wretched of the earth nothing less than the Bible of decolonization. Interestingly, however, Fanon's influence is perhaps even more pronounced, although decidedly less discussed, in Canada. For instance, in the 1960s, Quebec sovereigntists often borrowed the language of Fanonian anti-colonialism in their struggles for national recognition, while largely ignoring Fanon's insights into the problem of recognition and colonial context and the colonial context and, uh, and Quebec's problematic status in a white, as a white settler society actively complicit in the genocide and dispossession of indigenous peoples in its uh, claimed territories. Fanon's influence on black or on Quebec nationalism story is particular evident in the writings of Pierre Valliers, especially his famously titled book, White Niggers of America, written from prison and published in 1968. While Vallier uh, does not discuss Fanon explicitly, he nonetheless refers to himself as one of those, quote, wretched of the earth, providing testament to the subtle influence of Fanon's work um, in relationship to Quebec's contradictory standing as both colonizer and colonized. Indeed, to many within the Quebec sovereignty movement of the 1960s, Vallier was considered an intellectual hero of the Fonds de Libération de Quebec, or FLQ, uh, which was the armed, as we all know, armed faction of Quebec separatist movement at the time although he eventually distanced himself from the organization after its high-profile abduction and murder of Quebec Vice Premier uh, Pierre Laporte in 1970. The point here to note, however, is as David Austin's crucially important work does, is that, quote, while anti-colonial ideas found fertile ground in Montreal, uh, none took root as firmly as those of Fanon. Now, the questionable appropriation of Fanonian insights applied to the Canadian context didn't stop with the Quebec separatists. Indeed, none other than the Prime Minister himself, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, invokes Fanon's Wretched of the Earth in an important 1964 article that he wrote challenging the independence claims of the Quebecois on the grounds that they theoretically defend, uh, Fanon, or, uh, defend Fanon's views on violence while ignoring his really crucial impeat, or a critique, sorry, of the national bourgeoisie. He writes, some of the, this is Trudeau, 
Some of the counter-revolutionaries deceived themselves by dressing up in a Marxist-Leninist disguise, as has already been done by those African chieftains whom, indeed, they take as their models. But all this masquerade has been admirably, admirably described by Frantz Fanon in The Wretched of the Earth, which nevertheless our counter-revolutionaries say is the book that they keep by their bedside. This makes me think that they read no more in bed than elsewhere, so I shall do them a favor and quote at length from Fanon's text, published in 1961, and of which they have perhaps only leafed through the first chapter on violence, <laughs> our former prime minister. Given that Trudeau's theoretical use of Fanon is used to defend the territorial integrity of a colonial state founded on genocide, I think that we can safely presume that Fanon would be rolling in his grave regarding the interjection of his crucially important work into the largely white fucking colonial melodrama <laughs> that constituted the back and forth bickering between Canadian federalists like Trudeau and misguided Quebec sovereigntists like Vallier. Now, the 1980s and 90s began to see a middle ground charted between these two hostile camps, with millionaire Charles Taylor's work on recognition being the paradigmatic example. Responding to the increased demands for recognition made by Quebec and now First Nations, Taylor's work draws on Fanon and others, particularly Hegel and Rousseau, to map the contested relationship between recognition of cultural distinctiveness on the one hand and the freedom of marginalized individuals and groups in ethnically diverse states on the other. And I could talk about Taylor forever, but I won't, so I don't piss off Lee. <laughs> Perhaps more on the mark, though, has been Fanon's stamp on the intellectual output of Indigenous scholars and activists in Canada. Out of all Red Power era voices, Fanon's influence was most influential on the written work, at least, or in the written work of the late Métis historian uh, Howard Adams. Although, as I've come uh, to learn in conversations with Lee before, which he probably doesn't remember, that it also... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, um, left a profound mark on indigenous feminists like Miracle and others associated with the radical red power organizations like NARP in the 1970s, which is indexed importantly in a couple of crucial passages in her uh, Bobby Lee Indian Rebel. Now, according to Adam's own account, uh, he was first introduced to the literature of the black power uh, movement, Malcolm X, Cleaver, and so on, and the writings of third world anti-colonialists like Nkrumah, Fanon, and Memi, while a graduate student at Berkeley during the turbulent decade of 1960s radical activism. This experience would significantly shape the theoretical and historical analyses Adams develops in his two major political works, uh, 1975's Prison of Grass, Canada from a Native Point of View, and his 1995 follow-up, uh, Tortured People, Politics of Decolonization. In both these texts, Adams applies Fanon's insights into the nature of internalized violence to show how colonialism is able to um, sediment its dominance over native lands and bodies by warping our self-image and behavior um, in ways that make our dispossession and political subjugation appear appropriate uh, to our own uh, perceived cultural inferiority and backwardness. Now, if the influence of so-called third world theory arrived in 1960s Montreal via Fanon and Martinique, and onto the Canadian prairies via Howard Adams and Berkeley, or onto the West Coast via uh, Lee Miracle and NARP, I suggest it arrived in the North through the Dene Nation's working relationship with Shuswap leader George Manuel. There's ample evidence to support this claim. First, Manuel was a strong supporter of our, uh, the Dene Nation's land struggle and worked closely with its leadership to promote our bid for self-determination, as demonstrated in the pages of testimony he gave to the, at, in, in Yellowknife at the public hearings of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry in 1976. As stated in that testimony, Manuel saw the Dene as part of what he would come to champion as the fourth world, a phrase he first came across at an international gathering of diplomats from Tanzania and a number of other African countries in the early 1970s. Manuel's African ties were extensive. In 1974, he traveled to Tanzania as part of Canada's uh, delegation of diplomats invited to attend the commemoration of its 10-year anniversary since independence and, as the story goes, was mistaken by local politicians, including President Julius Nyeri himself, as one of Canada's lead delegates. <laughs> he was, at the time, the, um, the uh, uh, national chief of what was then the National Indian Brotherhood, now the Assembly of First Nations. Um, 
which is just fascinating. <laughs> Uh, the elite access, however, that this miscommunication enabled provided Manuel with an opportunity to gain lengthy conversations with President Nairi and some of his key uh, government ministers, apparently over copious amounts of wine, about the respectful uh, colonial experiences and what a genuinely post-colonial form of economic and social development might look like. One that didn't, as Fanon insisted, take its cues from mimicking European models. As Manuel states in his foundational The Fourth World and in Indian Reality, as all models of economic and social development I have seen, Tanzania is the closest example to my understanding of the way that Indian people want to develop. Tanzania is such a good example of the difference between the third and fourth world because neither of the people nor their leaders have been content to produce a new society that is merely a darker imitation of the world of their colonial masters. Now, when the Dene Declaration was made public in 1975, the predominant response was hostile. As I discuss in my own book, then Minister of Indian Affairs, Judge Buchanan, dismissed our declaration as gobbledygook that a grade 10 student could have written in 15 minutes. Even respected Cree leader Harold Cardinal condemned the declaration as an intrusion of left-wing thinking that is perhaps much closer to the academic community in Toronto than it is to the Dene. Much of the criticisms that were thrown at us at this uh, period expressed similar sentiment. Uh, namely, that the Dene leadership had been manipulated by southern white radicals and were therefore not acting in the interests of our own constituents. Uh, this assumption extended to the writing of the declaration itself, which at the time was believed to be by most non-natives in the north to be drafted by one of the Dene nation's non-native consultants, uh, namely Peter Puxley, based on his adaptation of Tanzania's Arusha Declaration of 1969. The thrust of the argument here again being that those cross-fertilizations could not have been grounded on Dene values or our grounded normativity and relationships through place, but had to come from the ideological influence of either settler society or uh, those elsewhere. Nothing could be further from the truth. As demonstrated in, a 19, or in an April 14, 1975 letter between a representative of the Ganawage sub-office of the Indians of Quebec Association and then Vice President of the Dene Nation, Richard Nirosu, detailed plans were in the works to send Dene field workers, which were essentially community-based activist researchers at the time, to Tanzania to, quote, learn from their experience in development for a period of two to three months. The letter was included as an information package compiled in 1977 by the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly uh, to generate public concern over the radical and separatist nature, or so supposedly separatist nature, of the Dene self-determination movement. We were also communists, too. They didn't like that. Um, also included in the package was a list of reading materials that then Dene Nation Community Development Program Director George Erasmus suggested might be useful in constructing a quote development philosophy for the Dene Nation. The list of readings included among others Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Albert Memmi's The Colonizer and the Colonized, and Regis Debray's Revolution in the Revolution. Also included in the materials were books on Tanzania specifically, including Nyerere's collection of speeches, Freedom and Socialism, Freedom and Unity, Nyerere on Socialism, and Socialism and, uh, and uh, Ujama, Essays on Socialism. According to Erasmus, these, quote, alternative sources on development were meant to supplement, not replace, research and perspectives drawn from our communities. Many alternatives must be looked at, wrote Fanon, or Fanon, Erasmus. <laughs> in a memo addressed to the Dene field workers, especially the examples of our culture, the approach to development and distribution of material and ownership that our forefathers took. We may wish to keep some aspects of the old way in this industrial era. Now the point of all this is that the resurgence politics that I advocate and, uh, for necessarily as Conway and her interlocutors suggest is an international assemblage of decolonial movements that are necessarily grounded in the normativities and ontologies of culture in place, but are not simultaneously straightjacketed by them, as many champions of progress and modernity suggest, including folks like Zizek, which you um, obliterate so humorously. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, we can talk about that later. Uh, unfortunately, however, it is the radically expansive politics of this grounded normativity that state-centric calls for recognition and redistribution, and then just the onslaught of more repressive aspects of state violence are either uh, are fundamentally working to undermine and destroy. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.